Bunnies like flying less than they like most things. Lucky rabbit's foot, indeed. <laughs> you know, the lucky rabbit's foot's are really unlucky for the rabbits they get them from. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> rabbit doesn't need money. <laughs> uh, how's the rabbit going to get all that swag of hay? Let's, Let's do this. It just grows out of the ground. Yeah, where are they going to get it? I mean, we're a rabbit in the city. Not a lot of good grass. You need money. You got to move. You're a rabbit. You're quick. You can get there. Yeah? Just but you want to leave New York? You want to leave New York? That's you're, where all the jobs you're, are. You're Where's, a rabbit? There's no rabbit jobs in New York. I think there are plenty of rabbit jobs in New York. Really? What's a rabbit job going to get for a Eat job? Eat all the dandelions. Where? Get them out of the park. <laughs> no more dandelions. Rabbit live in the park? Uh, be cute. Photo ops. Rabbit model. <laughs> If the internet has taught me anything, being cute is a business model. All right, well, how come you're not taking advantage of that? <laughs> uh, there is no way to read that but you having just said that I'm cute. Oh, because you own rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> you're not selling your rabbits for cute photo ops. So uh, the other day, I was biking home from work. We didn't intro this show. Oh, yeah, I guess we didn't. It's uh, Canical for Leibowitz. We <laughs> recorded this way later than normal. It's October 2nd, Geek Nights. Great. 2014. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so I'm biking home from work, and because they've added, like, three stop signs and a new light to my old way home, uh -uh. So, so now I actually go out of my way to take the bike path along the East River, like, all the way home. Because mm -hmm. that's just way... It's actually faster now most of the time. Because you don't have to stop. Unless I run every stoplight, but... Which is fine. Like, I'll do the Idaho whatever protocol, but... Lately, there's been cops there, like, hanging out at the intersections, and I saw a biker getting a ticket, so I'm going to just let that uh, hang out for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'm biking on the bike path. It's a separated two-lane bike path, a yep. green-painted one. It has some shitty areas, though, but most of it's okay. And they've actually they've fixed it bit by bit. Like, it's yeah, getting better and better. Some of the good parts are even better than they used to be, but the shitty parts are still shitty, like... The part by the power plant where it's really narrow. Yep. And the part by the little warehouses where the street is, you basically just going on this beat up old sidewalk. Oh, that's the worst. And that's the part the worst. where you have to go onto First Avenue because it ends and the UN's in the way. Yep. I don't know. I just don't go around the UN. So I'm biking and there's a, there's a thing. Oh, no, no. You're thinking of the East River bikeway. Yeah. I'm on the opposite side of the river. Oh. There's another. There's a bikeway right there too, and it has the same properties as the one on the other side of the East River. <laughs> yes, it it took three it properties. Has a, it has a power plant that doesn't exist, <laughs> with a narrow, with a narrow. <laughs> so what, so it has a bunch of old warehouses and like generating stations that are yeah, being torn down. Yeah, by the sugar factory. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so it took a couple of aspects. I was like, I think he's talking about the wrong. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm biking there. I'm going like 24 ish miles an hour. I'm going pretty fast because it's a slight downhill, and this woman. Just literally steps out between two cars, jaywalking right in front of me. Mm -hmm. So I swerve to the right because she doesn't even notice me. She keeps walking. And then her hand is back and she pulls into my path her young daughter. Mm -hmm. So now I literally almost flipped over my handlebars trying to not hit her daughter and probably severely injure her. Mm -hmm. I consider just slamming into the woman because I figured she could take it. Mm -hmm. There's no way to avoid them both. I, I, I almost flipped my hand over. I stopped. I barely avoid them. Uh, she screams and starts yelling at me. Mm -hmm. And for once, like usually I just ignore people when that happens. I just like keep biking. Mm -hmm. But I was like, listen, lady, you almost got your daughter killed. You're a terrible mother. Don't jaywalk. Mm -hmm. And... She was stunned into indignant silence. And then her daughter was like, Mommy, you should really listen to the man. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started laughing so hard that I almost cried. And I biked away because she was you so should have high five little daughter and then <laughs> biked away. <laughs> but it was like it was the kind of thing that normally only happens in movies. Like it was too perfect. Mm -hmm. Go little daughter, go. Yep. You're not gonna get killed <laughs> once you cross the street on your own. Yep. Though, funnily enough, I saw a video this morning. The Gothamist was like, this is what it looks like when a pedestrian jaywalks. Yep. Well, that guy, did you read that? Yeah. That, that dude, guy had a car horn. Well, no. He saw this dude coming because he had a light on his bike like he's supposed to. Yep. Well, and, you he, know. and he knew the guy wasn't looking, and he knew he wouldn't hit him, so he intentionally made it a close call to teach the guy a lesson. You know what? I, I approve. Yeah. You know what it's like? It's like I think that was just an old guy who's not can't learn a lesson. He's too old. Yeah, the the look of terror on his face though was kind of beautiful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's Thursday. It's the lounge. 
No, it's not. Talk it's about it's anything. the book club. You don't have book clubs in a lounge. Yeah? Huh? Imagine so got, a lounge with a book club in it, not getting out of good mix. So I got... Uh, Your book club belongs is, in, like, the library or there the There actually Barnes is a writer's lounge near our building. Yeah, it's but like, that's not a lounge like the kind of lounge that... That's the a, kind of lounge no. I'm thinking about. A lounge is the place where you have a lounge singer. I, did, I was thinking about the book lounge. That's not a lounge. I guess in the Midwest, the lounge there's you can have the lounge as a room separate from the a lounge room. is a place Den. with leopard print couches and alcohol and a small tiny stage with a shitty keyboard on it. Yeah. Or possibly no, no, a, no, possibly an organ wrong. with one of those cur- circle curtains that goes around it. Like now, if it's fancy, it'll be a real piano and there'll be a lady singing. That might be more of a club. When it, if it no, gets if it gets too lounge. good, it's no longer a lounge and becomes a club. Thing is, no nowadays club means bad music playing so loud you can't talk to anyone. Well, there are many kinds of clubs. This is an anime club too, right? Uh, but oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> a lounge is much more specific. So if you hit someone with the club, that's right. All right, all right. So anyway, it's the lounge. No, it's not. And recently, a time capsule was unearthed in New York. This is a time capsule from 1950, buried in Brooklyn. I think it was buried by the MTA or by the organization that became a uh, time capsule buried beneath old Metropolitan Transportation Authority headquarters in downtown Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. They cracked it open yesterday. And what they found inside was basically a note from the fu- a note to the past saying time capsules need to be waterproof, motherfuckers. <laughs> it was just a rotten mess of garbage. You gotta make a high quality time capsule. That's what makes it a capsule. Uh, so the funniest thing, everything was ruined. The microfiche, the document, it was all just this tomato soup looking rust sludge. Mm-hmm. The line at the bottom of this article is beautiful. The line at the bottom of this article is why I made this my news. Quote The capsule itself might, however, be salvageable <laughs> and will be put on display at the New York Transit Museum. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> Unless the, the caption is just the word fail in impact fonts. Out in Flushing at the World's Fairgrounds, you know, in the park, there's a real time capsule that is definitely still in one piece. I know about that time capsule. It's not supposed to be opened until well after we're dead. We should sneak there at night with jackhammers and get it. That's, hold it hostage? That, Scott, that's some Lupin shit. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, my God. I could, I could pull that off. What, if you're going to do that, do you know how those- to use a jackhammer. Do you know how to make it so no one will hear it? I know how <laughs> to use a jackhammer. Uh, maybe put, a, basically it's put con- a silencer on there's, it. There's a, there's a concrete sidewalk with like a metal plaque thingy, and then underneath that is a bunch of dirt. And I don't know if it's directly underneath that or not. It might be offset slightly. It's like if we dig straight down, we might not find it. There is a better time capsule that we could steal. Where? Uh, oh, no, it's the same one. So the people who made the one... Uh, the West, they're the Westinghouse time capsules, the one from the in the Corona Meadows Park. Right. They use that design to make a couple other ones as well. Right. The quality yeah. ones. You know how these things work? They're suspended by a string, mm-hmm. like a big metal cable. So they're just floating down in a deep pit. Yep. The inside, they're covered in this uh, alloy that's designed to last five thousand years without any sort of measurable corrosion. Mm-hmm. They're shaped like a missile. They're, they have glass, wool, nose cushions, and all these things in case they break. The inside is actually Pyrex glass. Mm-hmm. And then inside of that is a ridiculous amount of shit. So actually, we don't have to dig. We just have to basically flip the lid open, and grab the hook that it's hanging on, and lift it up. I think the lid is sealed. Look, here's here's what it looks like. The lid is sealed. You have to jack That is this not thing sticking off. out of the ground anymore. It's under. You can't see that part there now. If you go no, there. this is the exhibit. This just shows you what they look like. Oh, okay. I, it looks like they're... if you go there now, it's a piece of metal on the ground and yeah, there it of is. A concrete side. Yeah, so you have to bust the concrete up and then winch it out of the ground. Why don't we just get a crane? No one will notice that. There's the problem with this time capsule. Here is a picture of what's in it from when they buried it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It's got to last like a thousand years and no one's going to care because here's the picture. But we could have that stuff. Yeah. You know what? I'm pretty sure I saw this exact camera for sale at a like lomography shop in Brooklyn. Yeah. But that camera has film in it. That is true. That had pictures. These three things are reels of film. Yes. Yeah, so we could watch those films. That looks like a, mi- a computer mouse, but obviously it's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's good stuff in there. We yeah. Can... So uh, anyway, you got any news? I mean, well, I guess it's not really much news, but Windows 10, Windows 9 got skipped. Uh, I don't know. There's nothing really uh, to did say you about see, it. I saw an article where someone uh, <laughs> posited why Windows 9 was skipped. It's a bad number? Uh, no, here's the deal. 
Uh, and they showed some code examples, so there's some plausibility to this. catch up to, to Apple, which is OS ten. A lot of Windows version detection functions. Mm -hmm. Look for Windows space 9 dot star. Why? Because they're trying to detect Windows 95 or 98. Oh. That might be the only reason. That's a good reason, though. It is actually a good reason. Also, you know, 10's a much better number. It catches up to Apple. Well, like when WinAmp Apple's went... Apple's been on OS X for a thousand years. Remember when WinAmp went 1, 2, 3, 5? Yeah. But anyway, the you know the thing about it is I'm still using Windows 7. I, as am I. And it still feels perfectly new. It, it doesn't feel like there is a newer Windows. Like It's like, oh, yeah, Windows 8 is a thing that exists. Right. Well, I, here's the thing. I would have gotten Windows 8 if I built a new computer... Maybe Since I Windows guess Windows Seven came out, but it's like until there's a reason to get a new computer, it's like there's no reason for me to spend money on a Windows Ten, and I'm definitely not going to get a shady pirated one. Well, yeah, that's the future. The, the thing is with Windows now is that desktop and OS. everything that you still use your computer for, Windows Seven is totally fully supported. It's sixty. It supports everything. Every hardware is supported on a desktop all computer. News, all new software supports Windows Seven, and all the hardware I already have is supported by Windows Seven. Well, Scott, and, here's, so, here are the reasons to buy Windows Ten. One, you build a new computer. And you and can't you, get a copy of Windows 7. And you can't transfer your license that you already paid for because you bought the OEM license or whatever. Maybe. Two, your current version of Windows is actually out of support. Maybe. <laughs> Those are all the reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't, you know. The thing is, I feel like Windows 8 was the... It's not ME. Like people always talk. Like I saw all these charts. It's like everyone's so young they don't they don't understand or remember Windows. They're like, man, every other version of Windows sucks. Like the TikTok with the Apple phones. They're like, Windows ninety five sucked and ninety eight was awesome. It's like, all right, kid, already you're stupid. Windows ninety five was possibly one of the most revolutionary operating systems in modern history. Yeah. If I was Microsoft, what I would do is I would just be like, all right, you know what the fuck? It's called Windows. It's free for everyone except businesses. Businesses have to pay a fucking fortune. The end. Nah. And then the the business windows, the only differences would be things that businesses absolutely need that no well, human being... Well, you know what I'd sell? I'd sell things like holding, staging, and pushing patches, security restrictions. No, like I would just be like, yeah, uh, what's what makes Windows 10, like, businessy? Well, uh, not Windows 10, but, like, the business version, the business version. These applications that we also make that you absolutely need will refuse to run on the regular one. Ah. So... It's like, oh, you need SharePoint? That absolutely will just refuse to run on the, the free one. You so. know, it's, it's just really a shame that, I mean, there's Apple, which is OS and hardware. Mm -hmm. There's Windows, and that's it. Mm -hmm. the, that in all this time, there is still no... BOS. <laughs> Linux. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, at my company, we were talking about, you know, like charting frameworks and whatever and all this stuff. And we were looking at compatibility, and at one point we're like, wow, that framework's great, but it only works on Windows. And then we were all quiet for, like, several seconds. And then our new developer we hired is like, do we support the client on Linux? And I was like, well, yeah, it's Java, so it runs. And he was like, Does any has anyone ever used it on Linux? And I was like, my QA team. <laughs> 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 Linux desktop is a joke. Yes. But it's not Monday. It's Thursday. Yeah, this shows you how little news there is. Well, there's plenty of news. It's just not news. We like, what am I going to say about Ebola? Don't get it. Yeah. You know what you can learn about Ebola? Go to CNN. My opinion, don't touch people who look like they have Ebola. Don't go anywhere that you've heard about Ebola being. Unless you are an altruist who really wants to go help and make a difference. And if then, you are a doctor. Yes. Not just a dumb altruist who's not yes. a doctor. I don't want, I don't want some like... Lamo, and also a real doctor, not a made-up doctor. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> yes, real doctors only. <laughs> and like Ukraine, you actually know something about viruses too. If you're some other like a orthopedist, you're not going to be able to help. I'd happily talk about the fact that Kim Jong Il, Kim Jong Un, might have broken his ankles because he's fat. He just walking around. Yeah, like he might have fractured his ankles. He must have been doing something. He, yeah, isn't he always riding horses and shit? He probably fell off one. No, so there, it, there's a lot of video evidence that he's been gaining a lot of weight. And well, a lot wouldn't of, you if you were eating the whole country's worth of food and everyone else was starving? I have access to infinite numbers of calories compared to what my body could consume. Right. I ate seven or 800 calories of cookies right before we did the show, and I'm drinking a beer. Mm -hmm. I consume as much calorie as I can on an hourly basis, 
And I've weighed 150 pounds since, like, I was 16. Right, but he's eating food for an entire country of people to make sure that they continue to starve. That's in a, a way, lot more than no, 700 calories. In a way, that noble man is protecting his people from obesity and type 2 diabetes. Yes. <laughs> Instead, giving them things like scurvy and nah. malnutrition. I would love to talk about Ukraine, but you don't know or care. I need Andrew. We could, Andrew Andrew's my Ukraine buddy. Don't go there. Any place that's in the news is usually a place you don't want to go. That's my news. Oh, that's my advice. Oh, uh, trying to think of an exception to that. PAX isn't really in the news. New York Comic Con is in the news, and you don't want to go to that. <laughs> it holds out. It holds up. Usually nine times out of ten, or even more than that, if a place, of a location is in the news, don't go there. <laughs> so anyway, things of the day. This is cute and weird, so bear with me here. There is a pop song, apparently, called Anaconda that I'd never heard of. I didn't hear this either, uh, but apparently it's just a Sir Mix-a-Lot remix. Yes, so it's basically Baby's Sir Mix-a-Lot. Baby's Got Back by Sir Mix-a-Lot. But with girls. Sure. And it, it's, eh, not, not, it's not the greatest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. But the reason I found out about it is because College Humor posted Anaconda, the educational version. So I saw this, and I thought it was just a remix of... Sir Mix a Lot, because I didn't know that there was a, it was a remix of a remix of Sir Mix a Lot. So that is very much like the people who quote the phrase, We don't need no stinking badges. And they don't know. Where that it's is from, from Treasure of the Sierra Madre. That's like, right. Like you can tell. They think it's from Blazing Saddle. I actually, I've seen conversations. Well, seen. I, Which fact, it I, is from, but it's also from Treasure of the Sierra Madre. I witnessed a conversation several years ago at a convention. Mm -hmm. And the conversation went like this We don't need no stinking badges. And then the guy was like, ah, The Simpsons. <laughs> and the guy was like, uh, no, it's from Blazing Saddles. Uh -huh. And then this other guy who was sitting nearby, like at a table, looks up and he's like, you two are children. Yes. <laughs> and he did not explain what he meant by that. That is the person that you should sit down and have a conversation That's with. the person you go sit and play Hanabi with, like, right away. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who has listening to this who has not seen Treasure of the Sierra Madre, that movie is... <laughs> so... <laughs> you so should anyway, see it. this is just like... So this is a parody of a song that is a remix of a song, and it's kind of cute and funny because it's basically just like a sexy rap kind of music video, except... It's literally about anacondas, the snakes, and sexual dimorphism, and it's just, I don't know. Mm. Okay. All my other things of the day would require way too much explanation, and I got to save them for an appropriate, like, I need them to segue into something. So, continuing my hockey-themed things of the day this week, uh, here's another hockey-themed thing of the day. The Dallas Stars, who are not very good at hockey right Not now. the worst. No, I mean, you know. It's still preseason hockey. We don't know how they could be. They could suddenly be great this year. Unlikely. You know, Scott, I read a headline today, mm -hmm. and it was basically like, Rangers not seeing the Stanley Cup this year. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> it's pretty much probably going to be the West again, because well. all the good players are still in the West. Anyway, um, so the Dallas Stars, during their preseason hockey game, on the scoreboard, put up memes that they came up with making fun of the uh, fans of opposing teams that were in the stands. The, the winter is coming one is great. Brace yourselves. Bandwagon Blackhawks fans are coming. Oh. You know what this is? This is, this is Anime News Nina. Uh, for those of you who don't listen to the Anime Night, the uh, Anime News Network, which is pretty much the Reuters press of anime well, in, in the English-speaking English world. Yes. Like, in, outside of If you want Japan, anime news... Or news about anime, manga, Japan stuff in the U.S., Anime News Network is the place. It is pretty much the top. The like, only. the top, top. Like, one step under that is, like, Anime World Order. Another <laughs> step under that is, like, Austin, and Dave, and Joel. Uh, talk of USA Magazine? Uh, I put them on the level of halfway between Anime News Network mm -hmm. and Anime World Order. Because there's a lot of over... There's a Venn diagram at that Anyway. Point. Anyway. But they had a comic, Anime News Nina. It was pretty sardonic and funny, but the point was that it made fun of itself and of the thing that the organization was about. It's like the company making fun of itself and making the kind of humor that might offend really offendable people, but is actually funny. Mm -hmm. This is that. 
This is the kind of thing that I wish more everything's did. Yep. Actually be funny. Don't be completely corporate lame humor. And also just don't be like racist and sexist. Hire, just hire young people and let them have control and don't put stupid restrictions on them or punish them for being cool. Yeah. Because seriously, if you're old, like over the age of 40, and your 21-year-old, like just out of college, uh, motion graphics guy says, trust me, this is hilarious, I guarantee it is hilarious. Mm -hmm. At least to the people who are at your hockey game. Just verify that it's not also offensive. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know, the other problem with that person is that he is trying to sneak the goatsy in. That's right. There could be a hidden goatsy there. <laughs> you know how hard I'm trying to sneak the goatsy into everything I ever do? Have you snuck the ghost in anything at work? Uh, no, I have not, but I've snuck a whole bunch of pony in. All right. Lots of pones. Meta Moments? In the Meta Moment, the book club book is Can I Go for Leibowitz? We're going to talk about it. What's the next book club book? Uh, like, I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm debating whether or not to punish Scott for taking so long. It was summer. Would you want me to read books when the sun is out? Yeah, I, I, to be fair, it's a little one-sided because the reason I read seven novels... And since I finished Canticle for Leibowitz, well, six and a half, I'm not done with the seventh one, mm -hmm. is because I've had a number of transatlantic flights. In On your time. own. Yes. With no one else. So if you're not flying with a friend and you're flying like nine hours multiple times over the course of a month, you're going to read a lot of books. Because you can only watch so many cut down shitty movies on the back of a headrest and your laptop only lasts a few hours. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. I'm uh, I got to pick a book, and I got to decide how much I want to punish Scott. All right, so in the meta moment, I want to talk about just a few events that are happening in and around New York City and other nerdy places, I guess, mostly New York City. Oh, so, there is a secret burger crawl next weekend in New York City that you should go to. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. So most of these things are actually happening, like, October 11th, 12th. When we're at a wedding in Albany, it's Columbus Day weekend, I guess. Yep, that, Fuck that Columbus, is the... Fuck Columbus Day, but, you know. Yep. That's a day off for work. Anyway, yep. so here's the thing. So first of all, because New York Comic Con is also that weekend, I'm Boo. pretty sure, uh, there's a bunch of crazy nerdy events going on surrounding New York Comic Con that are vastly superior to New York Comic Con itself. So I think the Ghibli movie is now screening in the Oh, yeah, I think City. Emily might have bought tickets for that. Okay, that's number one. Uh, number two, there's the Hatsune Miku Expo in New York City, which includes... Hasani Miku concert in the Nokia Theater, which is the 11th and 12th. But then there's also this like art exhibit you can just go to. So we can go to that later. That's open for longer. Uh, there is uh, New York City. This is unrelated to nerdery. It's like New York City open house where you can sort of sign up and go to things that are normally not open. That's super nerdy. Sort of. So I really wanted to go to the TWA terminal at JFK, which Ooh. you can't go to. I think you can also go to like Woolworth Building and other shit. I was thinking about going to the Onion Domes, the Digesters. Oh, you can go. Well, you can just go there. You don't. Yeah. That's not a special day, but yeah, we can go there. Uh, so the website to sign up for those things is open now, but I'm not going to be here. And the last one, I don't think it's that weekend. I think it's maybe November 1st. I got to check the actual date and provide a link at some point. I'll mention this one again because there's more time between now and it. Yep. College Humor. Super Art Fight team up to bring you Super Art Fight versus College Humor. Oh, my God. In Brooklyn. Guys. Super Art Fight in Brooklyn for the first time ever. If you don't know what Super Art Fight is, go to this thing. <laughs> if you know what it is, go to this thing. Seriously. It's happening. The College Humor team, like the people from College Humor, if anyone's going to take down some of these long-reigning champions well, of I mean, Super Caldwell Art Fight, is not new to the Super Art Fight uh, you know, campus. No, he is not, but I imagine Caldwell teamed mm -hmm. up with, I can, uh, water, I, I'd have to pick who I'd team up You know what we need? You know what we should make? Mm -hmm. Fantasy Super Art Fight League. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you, you get points whenever they get a win. And yeah. Every time they draw a monocle, it scores a half point. <laughs> <laughs> Two points for a top hat. Yeah. Man, then you can you have a separate scoring system for, like, if someone does a webcomic, like, when those elements are included in the media they're publishing elsewhere, <laughs> it's like the fantasy player. Sure. <laughs> someone anyway. else make that. Yeah. That's all the things I can think of right now, but I'm sure there's more going down. So, in a few weeks, October 31st through November 2nd, Halloween, the anniversary of Geek Nights, I will be live at PAX Australia without scott unless someone wants to give me like a real lot of money right now yeah if someone gives it's scott, still like, theoretically possible if i'm given enough 
money in some currency. What's the number? That is legit. Would you go if someone gave you okay. two grand? Well, uh, no, I need a, would, two grand would. I need a price of a plane ticket. I'm saying two grand would cover the plane tickets. All right, and then I need a hotel to stay there, and then enough money to go from pack. Because I'm basically, if I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna go to Pack Sauce. Yep. And then leave Melbourne immediately to go to the Coral Reef area. Ah, uh, see, I'm landing in Sydney first. And I'm doing a professional conference. I'm lecturing, actually, on games at that. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing a lecture called, I think, Games, Trades, Regulation. I forget what I'm doing. <laughs> i got to make slides <laughs> for that. But yeah, I want to go to Paxos basically like a day before. See, you know, see the Melvin stuff that now I'm familiar with. Yep. Right? I'm so going to go to Wilson's fucking promontory this time. Sure. Then I'm going to go to Paxos, and then I want to go to the Coral Reef area, which uh -oh, is far away. Oh, I typed away. Wilson's. And uh, Google, and it didn't say promontory. It said uh, disease. Great. Don't get that. Uh, just like don't get Ebola. You can go to the Coral Reef, hang out there for like a week or two, and then come back. So that's how much money I need. Oh, also known and as And to the make prom. up for the money I'm going to lose not working. Wilson's Promontory, also known as the prom, is Victoria's most loved place. Sure. Huh. Ooh. We really should have gone here. Well, you know, we were only there for so long. Take that Phillip Island hike we did and just multiply it by like 100. Uh, it's too long. All right. Anyway, so I will be at PAX Australia on Saturday presenting losing and on Sunday presenting winning. I'll be in the United States chilling out, maybe streaming something, playing Netrunner, baking things. Yeah. Some, someone at work today said, put cheddar cheese on an apple pie. And I said, fuck no. That... I would do Swiss if I was going to do that. <laughs> no, I would do Port Salut. I would not do any cheese. Port Salut. The only dairy product that belongs in apple pie is an ice cream. Uh, so, so in Albany, right? Uh, Pete and Nuri, they asked me if I wanted apple pie. And then they looked at each other like he doesn't know. There wouldn't, how would they have apple pie that would be gluten-free? You can make apple pie that's gluten-free. Okay. Why would pie crusts are would actually you, one of the easier things to make gluten-free. Why would you want a gluten-free pie, though? Well, okay, you apple, have, apples are the primary part of the pie. It's well, a good just pie. Just have baked apples, then. So instead of ice cream, they gave me white chocolate mousse. That's not a bad choice. It was dangerously good yeah. to the point that I ate was so much. Was it actual white chocolate or... You know. It's actual white chocolate. Whoa. White chocolate mousse. It was so thick with caloric joy. Where do you get white chocolate mousse from? Uh, a mother makes it uh, is how you get that. That's how you get that. I can <laughs> get a... Uh, that mother doesn't have accurate recipes that I can follow. <laughs> uh, maybe in fact, the internet I asked, does. what's the recipe? Which was followed by more laughter and, well, you take some amount of cream. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm sure I, I can, don't know. I can get the internet. The internet well. <laughs> So, The Book Club, A Canticle for Leibowitz, which Scott chose. Yeah, so I chose this because, uh, based on my knowledge of it, I thought it was in the genre of it is a post-apocalyptic story, which it is, yep. where specifically society has been sealed in, uh, such as in Logan's Run or Phoenix Future or Fallout, where the character you're in a vault. Well, right? knowledge was sealed in. Yeah, so in the first chapter, it sort of is in that genre, right? Where it's about like monks in a monastery that's far away from everything else, and they're basically sealed. And they encounter a vault, right, where people were sealed at one point. And, but really, it's not about the, a society that is sealed in. It's, it's about something completely different. So I think... It is not actually in that genre. That no, is, I'm going to start off by saying it is definitely post-apocalyptic. Uh -huh, it is the most post-apocalyptic, and it is one of the earlier instances of what we would call modern post-apocalyptic. Because every most apocalypse stories before books like this were, you know, floods and mythology and those kinds of things. Yeah, this is a pretty typical, you know, old school like sci-fi book in a post-apocalypse on Earth with a dystopian society and whatnot. So. I mean, arguably, I guess uh, Mary Shelley's The Last Man is the first work in this genre of post-apocalypse. Mm. Canticle for Leibowitz is widely regarded to be one of the earliest modern takes. Mm -hmm. A lot of people point to this as being the precursor. Like, a lot of books are based on this book in some fashion. Mm -hmm. Though, I suspect that that number is dwindling because this book seems to be increasingly unknown. I don't know. I've been. I heard more about it. That's why it came up. It came up in so many places. I don't That's know. Why. It seems to come up in the same circles that a lot of our book club books come up in. That is not pop nerd culture at all. Anyway, 
So the book is really sort of these three books that are loosely tied together, uh, covering three periods in history of this post-apocalypse world. So the yeah. first one is still long after the apocalypse, but not so long after it. The second part is e like hundreds of years after that. It's like Renaissance, right? And, and then, then space future. And then the third part is way after the you know apocalypse. Now you guys read it. It's the book club. Spoilers. We're gonna talk about the book and assume you read it. So if you didn't read A Canticle for Leibowitz, you should go read it before you listen because we're not gonna explain any of the plot. Right. We're assuming you read it. Mm -hmm. Also. I read it a long ass time ago, so my memory might be fuzzy. I already <laughs> lost, like, I had a bunch of specific parts I wanted to quote. And I don't remember any of that anymore. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but if I had to summarize it, the moral of the first one, the Fiat Homo, is basically like the church survives, Renaissance, Dark Ages, humans always have Dark Ages. Yeah, pretty and much. And then monks in monasteries and staticness, like the, the feeling of Fiat Homo. It, it feels like it's the idea of being static, that whenever there's a dark age, whenever society falls behind, parts of it have to saw, like wall themselves off, and they can't innovate. They become entirely static. So these monks, generation by generation, nothing changes. Nothing changes. This, that chapter drills it into your head that fucking nothing has happened as far back as anyone can remember. Right, he's basically making a commentary on the history of our existing world by showing you this new history of a world that happens after our world ends, right? But he's basically putting it a in the human same... human society emerges after ours, the real, presumably the real one that we live in now, ends. And then it's like, oh, it goes through the same exact shit that this one went through. And this, yep. the first chapter goes through the Dark Age where... There is still some sort of intelligence, but really it's a dark age and there isn't any overall. So the people, well, you know who, what it is? The people who have it need to wall off and protect it and weather the storm. It's static and ritualized. Mm. That's just that the part, the spores of society become static, become unchanging, become ritualized, and their only purpose is to replicate that data such to the point that when society catches up to where they can understand its meaning, you get chapter two. In a way, they're a time capsule. Uh, <laughs> we just talked about that story was actually my favorite. Like the, I liked the, I enjoyed the book less as it went on. Uh, I agree. I mean, I, I guess Partly I, I, I liked, cared less. I like the interplay between the the guy who runs the monastery and the main character. Oh uh, yeah, because the main character was way smarter than everyone gave him credit for. But he was so humble. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the other thing, that first chapter, I think the all the other reason I liked it more is because it gives you the world world building. The second and third chapters. The world has already been built by the first chapter, so they sort of just take it for granted. Whereas the first one's a bit longer. It's it's sort of explaining to you, introducing you to this post-apocalyptic world, and that part is just really interesting. Saying like, oh, it went down like this. It's this definitely, in my, I believe, the first novel like this to use in this post-apocalypse the idea of the reader knows more than the characters. So they, like, there's one point where they're obviously referring to resistors. Mm -hmm. Like the resistors that actually most of you Geek Nights listeners have probably never seen. <laughs> so that reference would be lost. Mm -hmm. But the kinds of resistors I played with when I was a kid that I'd buy at Radio Shack with little colored bands. The, there are a lot of references like that that are obviously looking at the reader and going, you know what these are. Yep. You know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I see that trope used a lot recently in stories like this. Right. It, it's it, it sort of he's making a bunch of little points along the way. Like when he's talking about the blueprints, like why did they put white on blue? It doesn't, you know, it's like it makes no sense. And he's like coloring in the whole thing, trying yep. to reproduce, just assuming that the people from the ancient pre-apocalypse smarter times knew better. I mean, think right. if say I didn't know it about computers and I found a computer in a post-apocalypse and I was trying to like make it work again and make a new one, I would copy it exactly, not understanding why I was doing what I was doing. Yep. And do a lot of things that are dumb and be like, why do they do it this way? It's like, well, because there's other things you don't know. And just, you know, it's just interesting to think about like recovering, you know, the just having the artifacts and then trying to recover the knowledge. It's like that's what we do with archaeology in this world. Right. When we look at like ancient artifacts from some old civilization and you see how and it's like, you know, we don't we think we get it right. But you look at them and it's like, oh, it's obvious he's he's doing archaeology on our artifacts and look at him fucking up. But it's sort of obvious how he fucks up. But we're fucking up in that same way with the archaeology that we do. Uh, 
But there's there's a difference. We're in probably that much better at it than them because we right. But this we're is going, We are more advanced, looking at something less advanced. But even so, in a way, I found this interesting because most of the stories I read like this, the future society doesn't understand that the past was more advanced. Mm. In this story, they clearly understand. Every the character past. is like like they know pretty much what went down. Mm-hmm. They know that there was a nuclear war. They understand the yeah. Danger they're like of those it, they're things. like it's sort of like Adventure Time, like the Mushroom War. Yeah, you know. I mean. And like the they whole have funny bit, names for it, but they sort of know how Leibowitz is basically just like this nuclear engineer who just worked in the facility and had some personal drama, and how he became a saint. And I like that whole story there. I was disappointed, however, that Saint Leibowitz was a legit supernatural entity, as far as I can tell. Yeah, from what I can tell, he was as well. That that is the only part of this book I did not like, and it didn't really seem to matter too much because he hardly appears or does anything. Notable? Yeah. I mean, you could try to make an argument about maybe it was like an allegory or something, but I just don't see that having been Walter Miller's intent. No. I feel I feel like these books were written semi-rambly. Mm. Like, I feel like he was, when he was writing them, he was exploring these ideas, and I think his main goal was just to impress upon people the cyclical nature of, like, human society yep. and how we're on the edge of a dark age again. And I well, yeah, this was written in a you know Cold War time. I mean, it was written in what 1960. Yeah, that was one of the most dangerous times in all of human history. All right, so he's writing like, "Don't have nuclear war, guys," and uh, we could have. That was the time that we could have had it. But at the same time, he was almost arguing that it's inevitable. Yeah, well, it wasn't yet. Because look at in the third part at the end, the you know the spaceship goes into space. It's a monastery in space now because the second chapter will always happen. Hmm. The Fiat Lux, the second chapter, is basically suddenly the world catches up and smart people can figure out what this shit all meant. Yep. But how the monasteries on their own were not capable of doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. They're only doing it for academic purpose. Someone has a practical purpose and suddenly the world advances very quickly. And then the third chapter is they're going to nuke again and monastery in space. Mm -hmm. You wonder how can there wasn't a monastery, was there a monastery in space the first time? Right? Because the... The first, this is the second nuclear war that happens on this planet Earth, this fictional Earth. And, and the second one, they have nukes and they have spaceships at the same time. And the first one, didn't they have spaceships and nukes at the same time or not? Uh, if it was written in 1960, uh, we, I mean, we, at that time, we did not have spaceships that were really capable of anything like that. And it seems like the nuclear war happened around that time. Mm. Mm. Like, they had not gotten too far, as far as I could tell, technologically, yeah. beyond what was predicted the in the The technology in that third chapter is a bit weird, where some things are, like, way advanced. Like, you can just walk onto the spaceship in your sandals. But, like, his conception a nu- of a, a computer. nuclear drive, and you can just go. But, he's, yeah, the computer is, like, ENIAC, and it has it draws instead of having a monitor. Well, I guess that, that part made sense, because computers were kind of like that back then. Yeah. But it was interesting how they implied a lot of highly advanced capabilities to a lot of other things. But... Computers, as he envisioned them, were not significantly advanced in any interesting way beyond what existed at that time, and yet simultaneously had a few powers that to this day are basically impossible. Right. It's like he could somehow imagine technologies being super advanced in some aspects, but couldn't imagine them being advanced at all in other aspects. Yeah, though anyway. it seems like the space stuff was the only thing that was really super advanced. I think yeah, it's the medicine wasn't advanced really. Yeah. at all. It was partly just because he needed that for his plot at the end. I think. I guess so. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, the first chapter is pretty much you know this dark age. The second chapter is this renaissance where you know people suddenly actually care what the monks are up to, right? And but the monks are only like you know inventing light bulbs and getting all Thomas Edison because research. They don't actually want anyone to have light bulbs everywhere. But then, of course, the dude from far away comes and he wants light bulbs everywhere. And yeah. he's like, oh, shit. But the part, the one thing in that chapter that actually stood out as interesting to me, because the rest of it was kind of eh, was the fact that it's like that guy, you know, the guy who was the, you know, thought he was the hot shit. I forget his name. He realized, you know, he was all proud of being a smart inventor. But because this was the second society... He was really only a discoverer. He couldn't be an inventor. There was no way he could be an inventor of anything. Yep. All he could do is rediscover things that were already invented. And it's like, whoa. 
imagine like your whole life you spend discovering shit, but it's like no, you, you the whole you you your whole life has to go into this, and knowing that you put all this hard work in, but there were previous people who were way ahead of you, and you will never catch up to them ever. There's no chance, and all you're doing is just discovering and not actually inventing. Yep, and also simultaneously there the idea that. If secular, like, there's definitely this vibe that if secular pragmatic uses of technology are brought about, nuclear war is inevitable again. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no way around that. That's, well. that's definitely heavily implied by the way the books are put or the book is put together. Mm-hmm. Though the third chapter it felt really rambly, like the section about whether or not to let the woman commit suicide. Right. I mean, like. Half, like it really zoomed in on that for a long time. Yeah. So that and, th- that third part is like fifty percent nuclear war and fifty percent let's talk about abortion and uh, euthanasia. And it's like what? What is <laughs> like? Were they? Was he trying to tie them together? Because he really didn't tie them together at all. They were just sort of like two separate topics. The best that, way I could tie them together. This is. Does, does he want to say that God is punishing everyone? No, with no, no, no. War? This is kind of a stretch. So here's the way: if I were in high school and I had to write a paper on this book, what I would say is that the woman deciding whether or not to euthanize herself and her child mm-hmm. is basically an allegory for society because the woman knows she will die horribly. Mm-hmm. Society knows if it continues, it will nuke itself. Mm-hmm. Her choice is to stop the cycle and not exist, or accept her fate and die by the nuclear flame, knowing that you know society will be rewarded. This is where the analogy starts to break down already because yeah. her kid won't survive if she does that. Sure, right? but at the same time, if everybody committed suicide, there'd never be another nuclear war. If society did not advance, if the second chapter didn't happen, you could never have a nuclear war. But it's hard to say what the author was. Advocating? He was well, almost he's definitely advocating against nuclear war. I don't think anyone's advocating for nuclear yeah, war. But was he pro or anti euthanasia, the author? Because the character, the priest, was against it. Mm-hmm. But And the priest stayed against it. It wasn't one of those obvious ones where like the priest sees the light at the end. Yeah. Right? And also, like the whole thing was futile at that point anyway. And the priest was not portrayed terribly sympathetically in the book. Like he's kind of portrayed as this this old crufty priest. Well, who's the chapter, actually... the first thing they say in that third chapter is, "Yeah, this guy running the you know this abbot was quick to action and didn't sit around thinking about things for a long time." And the other ones in the first two chapters were the kind of person who would think and you yep. know. You know, this is very impulsive and, and whatnot. So but and like then you ki- see him exhibiting those characteristics. He's ki- him and the church are kind of portrayed as adding to the suffering here. It's not like the book is very ambivalent on the issue, mm-hmm. at least as far as I could read. Yep. Again, this is going from I read this a long time ago. Right. But also at the same time, they're the ones who, you know, are saving, I guess, you know, whatever. But what I find interesting, right, is that so in the the very first chapter, right, they, they, they're all about protecting, you know, the memorabilia, the things from the first civilization that are so important, right? Because they know that one day they'll be able to figure out what they are. Exactly. When they, in this, at the end of the third chapter, they go into space again. And what do they bring with them? The shit from the first civilization. They didn't bring memorabilia from their own second civilization, right? The, the history of the uh. second civilization is just like, is, is like unimportant. Right? It, it's like they're only, you know, it's like the first civilization is the one that, I guess, matters. And it's like anything that happened in the second one, they couldn't even remember, right? They had all this history of the first civilization, but you see him lying there at the end, and he's got like a bone with an arrow in it, you know, and it's clearly, you know, we know who that is. What's his name from the first book? Right. But he, they don't have their own history down. They didn't record any of their own history. They were so obsessed with the history of that first civilization. Well, that's where this book gets complicated mm-hmm. because it's, it's, there's a way to read this, I think, where if you look at the second chapter and really think about it, the church's preservation of the previous era was irrelevant. Those smart people 
were discovering these things and inventing them. The only reason they couldn't invent new things is because the knowledge already existed. But look at how far they'd gotten before they got access to that memorabilia. Yeah, that guy was on the verge of light bulb, and the only and they only barely beat him to the punch on light bulb because they had the memorabilia. So it was way, barely helpful. Whether or not it's intentional, this book is arguing that the preservation aspect of the church is irrelevant. As long as you preserved humans. Yeah. Right, and they have they can live and have resources. They're gonna figure out the same things humans figured out again with I just, s- enough I time. I don't know if the author intended this to be read this way, but it's very easy to interpret this book. Doesn't matter though, what the author intended, right? Uh, it might, I think in this, <laughs> this is the one case where it does. Not the one case, but <laughs> the reason I think it matters is that the book is obviously the author exploring these ideas at a time when the world is literally actually dealing with these ideas. Right. If we were in the 60s, this book would be a completely different read, right? If we read it when it was yes, written. Yes, because but in reading the 60s... It, but read, what is this book, you know, we only care about, we don't care about the 60s. We care about today, right? We don't care about then. That today, Then doesn't matter to us. Yep. Right? We, we're reading this book, we're alive today. That's what we, is important. Yeah. But also, like he, like I was reading his history, he converted to Catholicism after the war. Uh-huh. I think he he, he was he, yeah he was a bomber or a tail gunner and a radio man in bombers mm. and he bombed a Catholic church as part of his duties being a bomber. Mm. Uh, some other guy That's said definitely that he, relevant that he suffered from post traumatic stress disorder. Makes sense. I yep. would too. And yeah, so this is a man who saw the horrors of war, perpetuated them. Not saying the war was bad or unjustified, but saying that he, he was a bomber. Like, that's what he did. Mm-hmm. And he lived in the shadow of nuclear annihilation, and he wrote a book about it. You cannot read this book but in the context of the world at that time. Sure. Because a lot of the stuff in the third chapter, uh, there's a lot of terminology that I think would kind of not be recognized by kids today because... People like kids today don't really think about nuclear war the way that our parents thought about it. Isn't that a good thing? I think it is definitely a good thing. I feel like human society got to at least one major precipice, and we all collectively said, "Collectively said, okay, guys, let's just back up a little." Actually, bit. I read something recently. So the U.S. was going to basically dismantle a bunch of nukes, like we do, because we don't really need. And them. we didn't, in case we have to blow up an asteroid. Yeah, yeah. But and you know what? I'm sure some nut out there is going to be like, oh, see, Conspir- they're just making up excuses to keep a bunch of nukes around. But actually, I kind of believe that. Yeah. I feel like we should still no. keep the nukes that we have right now. I don't now. really believe that nukes are definitely going to save us from an asteroid. No. But what else do we have? No, I, I want to keep I'd it. rather shoot them and try than just sit there and get hit by an asteroid. I still think we need to keep them from a complicated geopolitical game theory perspective. Maybe. Sure, whatever. But we don't care about That's that. That's a separate discussion. <laughs> but, but think about it. We just read a book on the horrors of nuclear war and the inevitability of nuclear war so long as humans make nukes, yet I still feel like we can't, we should not destroy all the nukes we have because I don't trust everybody. <laughs> anyway, so the one thing that in this book that really kind of, I had no idea what it was there for, but it was fun, is the poet guy. That poet guy. That poet guy is kind of awesome. He, he reminded he, me he, of the poet in Hyperion. He did. He felt like the Hyperion poet and he felt like a little bit of choose goose going on. <laughs> A little, I can bit see of, that. little bit of choose goose. I can so totally see that. I was kind of into him as a character. He was all cool and, you know, whatever. But at the same time, I couldn't understand what his meaning was to anything whatsoever. And then they bring him up again in the third chapter as sort of another one of those they don't know their own history. They don't remember who the poet was, you know, the, the poet of the eyeball or something. But look at I, the- what, is the, what is the meaning of the glass eye? I have no fucking clue. Um, I couldn't even guess. The Eye of Knowledge. Uh, I, I had a bunch of notes I wrote down, but they don't make sense to me now because I read the book a while ago. Right. And is there a, the only thing I could think of was like, so the poet was sort of like the guy without an eye was the was the sort of poet character of the third chapter, the lady with two heads. Uh, was that sort of like the, you know, and then who was the poet character of the first chapter? I don't know. Well, the lady with two heads and the, the, the quote miracle there. Mm hmm. Was interesting. That could have easily been a hallucination, too. Yes. I was half, you know, so, going on the hallucination. Or he was already in some sort of afterlife seeing that shit. So let's go yet again to reading this book in a particular way. Mm-hmm. So 
we have, you know, the Leibowitz becomes a saint. Yeah. And there's this mythology around his life and his wife and all those things based on incomplete knowledge. Mm. There's the skull of the guy who got shot with the arrow. There's all these legends. The eye. The fact that the eye thing was, from a literal reading, a totally just generic, you know, the guy just, like, had the eye and he tried, and the, the famous guy, like, tried to give it back to him and couldn't. And you can see how later there became a mythology around this completely mundane and kind of humorous event. A mundane and humorous event became a for real serious mythology once enough time had passed. Mm-hmm. So the miracles of the Bible and all the times before this, these books even take place could easily be misinterpretations and failings and of human memory from mundane events of that era. And him seeing that vision at the end could just be him hallucinating or interpreting something in a way that would make sense in light of his mythology. Mm. And there's a lot of ways to read this book that basically really put down religion, the church, and preservationism. For someone who though, converted to a Catholic. But even on a surface level, but even though on a surface level, I think people who read this book and don't think about it too much would say it says the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. A deeper read. It's almost like I, it's, you know, I almost feel like you can read it either way, and maybe that was intentional, right? Whether you're Catholic or not, or anything else, religious or non, you can, you know, you'll read it, and you can basically ha- feel like it was telling you that you're right, but it's always telling you you're right. Nukes are bad. Yep, I found some essays <laughs> where people very passionately argued opposite positions on whether or not the book was pro or anti euthanasia. Mm-hmm. I think Luke Burge even posted some of that stuff. That's why I was reading it. You know, but it, either way, it makes you think about it, and it, pre- it does. and it presents pretty much all the arguments both ways. May I present a crazy idea? It even pre- it even it presents you know religious arguments you know in a lot, but it all it presents secular arguments in both directions as well. I wonder if Miller writing this book because he obviously was didn't, was, didn't have a firm conviction himself, or even if he thought he did. In actually exploring the idea, he went from optim like optimistic to cynical in every chapter. Mm. That him writing, he started to see the flaws in the optimistic or religious arguments, and then started undermining them either consciously or not. Maybe. Uh, also, a, a note here about his life that might be relevant. It's, it's uh, gonna be. So after the success of *Mechanical* for Leibowitz, Miller never published another novel or story in his lifetime. Okay. In Miller's later years, how he successful was it when he wrote it? Originally? Really successful. Okay, he became a recluse, uh, avoided his family, lived alone, never talked to his literary agent, to never let him meet him. He was protecting uh, the memorabilia. Struggled with depression, uh, wrote a six hundred page manuscript as a sequel to *Canical for Leibowitz*, and then took his own life with a gun. Where's the manuscript? In nineteen ninety six, the sequel *Saint Leibowitz and the Wild Horsewoman* was completed and published in nineteen ninety seven. Oh, we should read the sequel. No, we shouldn't. It's 600 uh, pages. Set 80 years after the events of the second part. So it takes place between the second and third part. I feel like this is going to be a fall of Hyperion. I feel like there's no reason to read 600 pages. <laughs> yeah, it's all about text art that stuff. Were, that are written by a guy uh, who is a, cra- a crazy hermit in the woods. This looks like pulpy drama rather than serious exploration of nuclear holocaust. Yeah, I mean... You sort of had that sort of, you know, that Tex Arcana. That really felt more like a, a Fallout. Like you could see hints of that coming in, like the kind of the plot of a Fallout kind of world. Yeah. Right? When they were talking about like you know like the different bandit groups out there, and you know like there was this other like you know universe where Fallout kind of stuff was happening, but it was far away and it only barely interacted with uh, you know the characters of the, any of these chapters. So. I'm glad I read it because it's such a precursor work to a lot of other things. Don't know if I enjoyed it that much. As a, I mean, it didn't just take me a long time to read because it was summertime. <laughs> it's because anytime I was sitting there and there was a list of media to consume, it did not rank highly at any given moment. You know, I mean, I burned through once I actually started. Uh, the first chapter went by pretty quickly. Then this, I didn't start the second one. You know, and I feel actually the the fact that it was split into chapters also sort of delayed the reading because once I finished a chapter, it's like I didn't want to start the next one. But yep. once I started one, I was able to go through. But it. But then again, look at books that are written very like The Prince of Nothing is an example. A lot of times, they're reading a chapter that follows like a character, and I'm really invested in that. 
and then the chapter ends, and the next chapter is about a character I don't care about. Yeah, I'll, that's a good time. I'll stop. But if I read more than one paragraph of that next page, oh, forget it. Now I'm invested. <laughs> and then if you finish that chapter, it goes back to the other character, and, and then, then you're then... like, oh shit, Ryan, I wonder what Kellis is up to. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but this is completely different. Like it's like three stories in one that are like you know barely. They're not barely related, but. It's not like you're skipping around different characters at the same point in the same story. It's yep. really three short stories in the same universe with a tiny thread. And each one makes them. a lot of subtle a lot like Robotech. <laughs> well, like look at when uh, the Garbage guy. Room. I keep thinking his, his name's not Catterley, but I was thinking of as Catterley, the, the the smart dumb monk in the beginning. I forget. You don't remember his name either. I don't remember names from United people States. in books. The military surviving the war. Alberta and Orville Leibovitz. What's the guy's fucking name? Wikipedia. What's the guy's fucking name? Doesn't say whatever. I can just look through the book here, but it's an ebook, so it's kind of hard. So, reading the book from like just reading that first section, there's a bit about how we're like he goes to the Pope, uh, and yep, yep. that long section about how overwhelming the experience of being in that place is. And how different it is from the monastery, and how it overwhelms the senses, and it's so large and powerful and thick with portents. But at the and same yet, time, it's sort of run down. Yeah, but then after he's not overwhelmed by it anymore, and he talks to the Pope, he realizes that it's not any different. It's just more worldly. Everything's run down. Everything's, you know, the symbols are more powerful than the reality. And the sort of idea that that's why people are hustled in and out. The church has all this symbolic power, but no real power. Mm -hmm. But the symbolic power works unless you let people hang around too long or look too closely. Mm -hmm. It also has the whole bit about not iconoclasm, but the, you know, the the book letter leggers trying to save knowledge from the fact that the you know when the apocalypse happens there's a lot of survivors it's a much more realistic nuclear war than most stories yep and the survivors destroy all knowledge because fuck those guys yep and that whole section has a lot of interesting ideas but again they're all over the place the rampaging mobs who call themselves simpletons uh, it's a lot like the uh luddites yeah i mean it, it's in a way right the book is you know again you see, you can find things in this book to support, like, whoever wrote this book was it was a Luddite. He want, you know, anti-technology. You could also say the opposite, right? He shows how awesome all that technology is yep, I in think the third chapter, except he was nukes. A, he was a sad, disturbed, complicated person who had a complicated, ch evolving view of what all these things meant. And this book is him exploring these ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's all it is. It's him exploring the ideas. It, the book, he doesn't, like, the chapters don't end with, like, oh, that is what I should think. That is the moral. The book ends with, wow, that's a lot of ideas and things are complicated. Mm -hmm. So I guess I like it on that front. It's a lot, it, it's a lot like trying to interpret uh, The Man Who Was Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> in that regard. Only a lot less action. Yeah. Though at the same time, the action in the man who was Thursday was largely incomprehensible, but that's a <laughs> that's just an artifact of the writing. Yeah, Thaddeo, uh, that's the cool guy. Okay, Thon Thaddeo. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I like Thon Thaddeo. That's a good name too. I like how Thon Thaddeo was. He realized the danger of what he was doing, but he did it anyway. But he tried to be honorable. Mm. He's just a fun character. I liked him. All right. Is there anything else to say about this book? I don't think so. It's relatively short, actually. I shouldn't have taken that long to read it if I actually tried. Yeah. I mean, once I started reading the third chapter, it took literally like a day, not even like a couple hours. So you could probably read the book in eight hours total. Yep, easily. Yeah. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.
Bunnies and flying. Uh, bunnies like flying less than they like most things. Lucky rabbit's foot, indeed. <laughs> you know, the lucky rabbit's foot's are really unlucky for the rabbits they get them from. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> rabbit doesn't need money. <laughs> uh, how's the rabbit going to get all that swag of hay? Let's, Let's do this. It just grows out of the ground. Yeah, where are they going to get it? I mean, we're rabbit in the city. Not a lot of good grass. You need money. You got to move. You're a rabbit. You're quick. You can get there. Yeah? Just but you want to leave New York? You want to leave New York? That's you're, where all the jobs you're, are. You're Where's, a rabbit? There's no rabbit jobs in New York. I think there are plenty of rabbit jobs in New York. Really? What's a rabbit job going to get for a Eat job? Eat all the dandelions. Where? Get them out of the park. <laughs> rabbit, no more dandelions. Rabbit live in the park? Uh, be cute. Photo ops. Rabbit model. <laughs> If the internet has taught me anything, being cute is a business model. All right, well, how come you're not taking advantage of that? <laughs> uh, there is no way to read that but you having just said that I'm cute. Oh, because you own rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> you're not selling your rabbits for cute photo ops. So uh, the other day, I was biking home from work. We didn't intro this show. Oh, yeah, I guess we didn't. It's uh, Canticle for Leibowitz. We <laughs> recorded this way later than normal. It's October 2nd, Geek Nights. Great. 2014. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so I'm biking home from work, and because they've added, like, three stop signs and a new light to my old way home, uh-uh. so, so now I actually go out of my way to take the bike path along the East River, like, all the way home. Because mm-hmm. that's just way... It's actually faster now most of the time. Because you don't have to stop. Unless I run every stoplight, but... Which is fine. Like, I'll do the Idaho whatever protocol, but... Lately, there's been cops there, like, hanging out at the intersections, and I saw a biker getting a ticket. So he listened to the man. Yeah! <laughs> and then I started laughing so hard that I almost cried, and I biked away because she was you so should have high-fived little daughter and then <laughs> biked away. <laughs> but it was, like, it was the kind of thing that normally only happens in movies. Like, it was too perfect. Mm-hmm. Go, little daughter, go. Yep. You're not going to get killed <laughs> once you cross the street on your own. Yep. Though, funnily enough, I saw a video this morning. The Gothamist was like, this is what it looks like when a pedestrian jaywalks. Yep. Well, that guy, did you read that? Yeah. That, that dude, guy had a car horn. Well, no. He saw this dude coming because he had a light on his bike like he's supposed to. Yep. Well, and, you he, know- and he knew the guy wasn't looking, and he knew he wouldn't hit him, so he intentionally made it a close call to teach the guy a lesson. You know what? I, I approve. Yeah. You know what it's like? It's like... I think that was just an old guy who's not can't learn a lesson. He's too old. Yeah. The, the look of terror on his face, though, was kind of beautiful. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's Thursday. It's the lounge. No, it's not. Talk it's about a, it's anything. It's the book club. You don't have book clubs in a lounge. Yeah? Imagine so I, a lounge with a book club in it, not getting out of a good mix. So I got... Uh, Your book club belongs is, in, like, the library or the There actually the is a writer's lounge near our building. Yeah, it's but like, that's not a lounge like the kind of lounge that... That's the a, kind of lounge no. I'm thinking about. A lounge is the place where you have a lounge singer. I, did, I was thinking about the book lounge. That's not a lounge. I guess in the Midwest, the lounge there's you can have the lounge as a room separate from the a family lounge room. is a place Den. with leopard print couches and alcohol and a small tiny stage with a shitty keyboard on it. Yeah. Or possibly no, no, a, no, possibly an organ wrong. with one of those cur- circle curtains that goes around it. Like now, if it's fancy, it'll be a real piano and there'll be a lady singing. That might be more of a club. When it, if it no, gets if it gets too lounge. good, it's no longer a lounge and becomes a club. Thing is, no nowadays club means bad music playing so loud you can't talk to anyone. Well, there are many kinds of clubs. This is an anime club too, right? Uh, but oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> a lounge is much more specific. So if you hit someone with the club, one, uh, the West they're the Westinghouse time capsules, the one from the in the Corona Meadows Park. Right. They use that design to make a couple other ones as well. Right. The quality yeah. ones. You know how these things work? They're suspended by a string. Mm-hmm. Like a big metal cable, so they're just floating down in a deep pit. Yep. The inside, they're covered in this uh, alloy that's designed to last five thousand years without any sort of measurable corrosion. Mm-hmm. They're shaped like a missile. They're they have glass wool nose cushions and all these things in case they break. The inside is actually Pyrex glass. Mm-hmm. And then inside of that is a ridiculous amount of shit. So actually, we don't have to dig. We just have to basically flip the lid open, grab the hook that it's hanging on, and lift it up. I think the lid is sealed. Look, here's here's what it looks like. The lid is sealed. You have to jackhammer this thing off. That is not sticking out of the ground anymore. It's under. You can't see that part there now. If you go no, there. this is the exhibit. This just shows you what they look like. Oh, okay. I, it looks like they're... if you go there now, it's a piece of metal on the ground and yeah, there it of is. A concrete side. So, yeah. So you have to bust the concrete up. And then winch it out of the ground. Why don't we just get a crane? 
No one will notice that. There's the problem with this time capsule. Here is a picture of what's in it from when they buried it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It's got to last like a thousand years and no one's going to care because here's the picture. But we could have that stuff. Yeah, you know what? I'm pretty sure I saw this exact camera for sale at a, like, lomography shop in Brooklyn. Yeah, but that camera has film in it. That is true. That had pictures. These three things are reels of film. Yes, we could watch those films. That looks like a, a computer mouse, but obviously it's not. <laughs> There's good stuff in there. We yeah. Can... So, uh, anyway, got any news? I mean, well, I guess it's not really much news, but Windows 10, Windows 9 got skipped. I don't uh, know. There's nothing really uh, to did say you about see, it. I saw an article where someone uh, <laughs> posited why Windows 9 was skipped. It's a bad number? Uh, no, here's the deal. Uh, and they showed some code examples, so there's some plausible. That's right. <laughs> all right, all right. So anyway, it's the lounge. No, it's not. And recently, a time capsule was unearthed in New York. This is a time capsule from 1950, buried in Brooklyn. I think it was buried by the MTA or by the organization that became... Uh, Time Castle buried beneath old Metropolitan Transportation Authority headquarters in downtown Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. They cracked it open yesterday. And what they found inside was basically a note from the future, a note to the past saying, Time capsules need to be waterproof, motherfuckers. It was just <laughs> a rotten mess of garbage. You gotta make a high quality time capsule. That's what makes it a capsule. Uh, so the funniest thing. Everything was ruined. The microfiche, the document, it was all just this tomato soup looking rust sludge. Mm -hmm. The line at the bottom of this article is beautiful. The line at the bottom of this article is why I made this my news. Quote, the capsule itself might, however, be salvageable <laughs> and will be put on display at the New York Transit Museum. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> Unless the, the caption is just the word fail in impact fonts. Out in Flushing at the World's Fairgrounds, you know, in the park, there's a real-time capsule that is definitely still in one piece. I know about that time capsule. It's not supposed to be opened until well after we're dead. We should sneak there at night with jackhammers and get it. That's, hold it hostage? That, Scott, that's some Lupin shit. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, my God. I could, I could pull that off. What, if you're going to do that, do you know how those... to use a jackhammer. Do you know how to make it so no one will hear it? I know <laughs> how to use a jackhammer. Uh, maybe put, a, basically it's put a silencer on there's, it. There's a, there's a concrete sidewalk with like a metal plaque thingy, and then underneath that is a bunch of dirt. And I don't know if it's directly underneath that or not. It might be offset slightly. It's like if we dig straight down, we might not find it. There is a better time capsule that we could steal. Where? Uh... Oh, no, it's the same one. So the people who made the one... So we're going to just let that uh, hang out for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'm biking on the bike path. It's a separated two-lane bike path. Yeah. The green painted one. It has some shitty areas, though, but most of it's okay. And they've actually they've fixed it bit by bit. Like, it's yeah, getting better and better. Some of the good parts are even better than they used to be, but the shitty parts are still shitty. Like, the part by the power plant where it's really narrow. Yep. And the part by the little warehouses where the street is... you basically just going on this beat-up old sidewalk. Oh, that's the worst. And that's the part the worst. where you have to go on to First Avenue because it ends and the UN's in the way. Yep. I don't know. I just don't go around the UN. So I'm biking, and there's a, there's a thing... Oh, no, no. You're thinking of the East River Bikeway. Yeah. I'm on the opposite side of the river. Oh. There's another there's a bikeway right there too. And it has the same properties as the one on the other side <laughs> of the East River. Yes, it it took three it properties. Has a, it has a power plant that doesn't exist <laughs> with a narrow uh, with a narrow <laughs> so bridge. What, so it has a bunch of old warehouses and like generating stations that are yeah, being torn down. Yeah, by the sugar down. factory. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so it took a couple of aspects. I was like, I think he's talking about the wrong. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm biking there. I'm going like 24ish miles an hour. I'm going pretty fast because it's a slight downhill. And this woman just literally steps out between two cars, jaywalking right in front of me. Mm -hmm. So I swerve to the right because she doesn't even notice me. And she keeps walking. And then her hand is back and she pulls into my path her young daughter. Mm -hmm. So now I literally almost flipped over my handlebars trying to not hit her daughter and probably severely injure her. Mm -hmm. I consider just slamming into the woman because I figured she could take it. Mm -hmm. There's no way to avoid them both. I, I, I almost flipped my hand over as I stopped. I barely avoid them. Uh, she screams and starts yelling at me. Mm -hmm. And for once, like usually I just ignore people when that happens. I just like keep biking. Mm -hmm. But I was like, listen, lady, you almost got your daughter killed. You're a terrible mother. Don't jaywalk. Mm -hmm. And she was stunned into indignant silence. And then her daughter was like, Mommy, you should re 